Yeah. I'm excited to have him here for everybody on Zoom too. I'm excited to have him here because we typically, when we have people here talking about long-term investing and just kind of like setting ourselves up, it's very real estate focused around like investment properties and stuff. So uh, Justin, him and you, you and I have known each other for like 10 years now. Mm -hmm. I started off in the business with him, but he, uh, I think he's going to give us some, just some better insight into like different options and different vehicles to build a, a holistic plan with real estate being one of those pinnacles. So um, I think this will be really valuable for everybody and hope you all enjoy. And Mr. Thanks so much. All right, I buddy. appreciate it. Yeah, I knew Chris when he was just starting out out of school. Um, he was UCF. He was dating this girl who I couldn't originally pronounce her name. Um, that is now his wife and mother of <laughs> his children. Um, and uh, I have, I've had clients at KW uh, in Claremont, I mean, literally going on 12 years. Um, but when I used to make the drive from downtown Orlando on 50 coming out to Oakley Seaver, uh, 50 looked very different when I started my career back then. So like, I don't know, I drive out here, I'm like super pumped for y'all, where even if you're just moderately paying attention, there's so much opportunity out here. Mm -hmm. So it must be a really exciting time to be here for you. Um, but I'm going to, I have all these slides. I'm going to, I really wanted this to just be um, how, how do investments work basically? And how do, how does real estate fit into this? If you're a business owner, how do you fit everything in for yourself? And also when you position yourself to clients, how do you position real estate among the other things? So if maybe from a perspective of a holistic financial planner, you can have it as, okay, another arrow in my quiver to be more effective when I'm, when I'm in front of clients, because I, I think the only way you'd ever be a, a client of mine is if you're making money and crushing on real estate. So I want to make sure that from a perspective of how do we serve our clients in the community, how do we work collaboratively so that they get what they want? And in the perspective of a holistic financial plan, where does everything fit together? Cool. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fucking you know, teacher where I'm lecturing you. Please interject. I want this more to be a conversation than me just up here being a robot financial person uh, talking about this stuff. I, but at the end of the day, I want you to leave more uh, informed, more knowledgeable on it. Cool. We have very, very, very high expectations. Oh. So you need to crush it. Okay. Or it's going to be a problem. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, that, that's, that's a great start. Um, uh, so I'll give you a quick background on me before I go into content. Uh, I started my practice, great time to start a career in financial planning, October of 2009. Uh, I had a Brown Azuzu rodeo, uh, $10,000 of student loan debt in a market where I didn't know anybody. Um, and I was on this drug called Male Ego and uh, had a rough start when I uh, started in my early 20s. And I'm so grateful for all the headwinds that happened early on because I just I've become so convicted in my beliefs out of failure. And um, my hope is that, like, as I kind of described to you a little bit about this stuff, that it is put in the context of how do you win without how do we, how does someone judge you? You know, it's only more about you winning with money. Um, and now, so fast forward, that was October of 09. Now we have clients in 31 states. We manage over 70 million. Um, we have staff of three. Um, I am also for Northwestern Mutual, the chair of, um, the, anybody a sports fan in here? Um, so like, you know how uh, they have a players union in certain professional sports? We have a players union uh, that collaborates with the home office and I chair the committee for that uh, specifically for integrated ops because I think where Chris and I vibe a lot is we're both like I think more naturally detail oriented left brain people and I like systems processes tech I'm like the tinkerer in chief of how do I make things go a little bit faster and outside of the investment conversation for everybody here today I was actually going to show you 
some things that I use with my, anybody have an iPhone here? Yeah. I'll show you like ways that I use the app shortcuts to run my business more effectively in front of clients um, that you guys can do too in your world. Shortcuts. Yeah, you bet, dude. A lot, a lot of what I do is really, really, because we're all in service-based business. So it's just, I use stuff where to make life a lot easier of like reaching out to clients, scheduling, uh, introductions with referrals, just to make that less friction. Um, so I, I'm going to go over investments today. And before I go into any of that, anything you guys want to cover, um, because it's you're investing your time. So I want to make sure that this is good use of your time. Um, anything you want to go over today? What specific... Um, when you say like a holistic investment portfolio, mm -hmm. are you talking about like looking at like stocks, bonds, like um, materials, like like uh, precious stones, stuff like that? Are you talking about all of that stuff? Is there like a specific segment of that stuff that you're focusing on? Or? Yeah. I, so what I typically do with clients is uh, I'll kind of go to this slide real quick of um, make sure it's on there. Like I describe to clients, like what's my mission? My mission is to align your um, values, dreams, uh, your mission with money to expand what's possible. And most of what my clients want to do is they want to buy financial independence. Like how do I put money wherever the fuck I put it to buy freedom that I don't have to go work for someone else that I can based on my pile of money, my income stream, I can buy freedom in the way I want it that's unique to me. Right. So, yeah, what's up? Uh, we, are we going to go over any kind of investments that generate passive income? Sure. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, passive income, where, where we put it, anything else you guys want to cover? Cool. All right. Fire away if we're going. Um, Dana White, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't know. He's not a pretty. <laughs> He's got um, a handwriting for a lefty. I forget that you're left handed. Um, uh, so, and if you're on Zoom and you want to put something in chat, I can go ahead and make sure that I'm covering it. Um, so, investment basics, there are really five that when we're setting up investments for clients that we go over. Um, I'm going to make sure that we go in detail. One is goal setting, two is risk reward, three diversification, four is discipline, five is momentum. Um, a lot of what investments are, I think, if you're who, who's here um, in their 30s or younger, raise your hand. So like what I describe to clients when you're in your 30s and younger, so much of what you do is behavioral, is getting in the habit of putting money away is probably the most important skill set. And then as you get older, then it becomes a little bit more specific of, okay, how are we managing where it's going? Because if you're in the behavior of putting money away and paying yourself first, a lot of this is easy. Um, it's just more, we're all running so hard. We have so many other demands. Anybody have kids in here? Raise your hand. Yeah. They are they cheap? Very. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's uh, you guys are all running businesses. It, it, business has demands on marketing, people, real estate costs. Like that's not cheap either. So we're always so pulled in so many different directions that it becomes when do we pay us first? And a lot of the job is just first, how do we make sure that we get in the right behaviors? Uh, but I'm going to go through these step by step. Um, this is not like, again, I, more conversation than me lecturing, um, but these are some of my core values in how we go ahead and build investments is one, you have expert guidance because where do people get messed up is they, they try to, you know, DIY too much that's complicated and they treat it, you know, buying financial independence, which is a big deal. They try to DIY that. Um, I think it's fine DIYing, like fixing a plumbing problem, but where your money goes so that you never have to work for someone else again and making sure the pile lasts. You just might want an expert there. Um, I also don't believe in market timing. 
I just don't think you can consistently do it. If if I did, no offense, I wouldn't be here. I'd be managing billions upon billions because I'd be the only person who could do it on a consistent basis. Not saying it can't happen. I mean, I'll be one. I bought my home uh, just one block from Winter Park, three two seven eight nine. I'm three two eight zero three. I bought for three ten. And now my home, like six, seven years later, is like 670. Like I, that worked out pretty good. I just don't know that I could recreate that year over year yeah. with clients all the time. With real estate too, you can't judge the peak, the peak or the, the bottom. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. So I, I very much believe in asset allocation. We'll describe like what does that mean? along with investing fundamentals. Like what, what are the fundamentals that make up, what, what do investment managers do um, so that you actually move the needle in rate of return um, with the least unit of, of risk associated to it? Um, so, uh, okay, who, who thinks the stock market is a wild ride? Raise your hand, yeah? Yeah, it's, so take a look. This is from 1930, uh, the one-year return to the S&P 500. To define S&P 500, it's the 500 largest companies in the United States at that time. So Google wasn't around in the 30s, right? But Google, going to guess, top 500, right? Mm -hmm. But you see that there are up and down years. Some are really down. Anybody get I guess what was happening around here? Great Depression. That's right. Anybody have a gap? Uh, a guess of what was happening, like right around here in the seventies? Oh, uh, world crisis. That's right. Anybody have a guess what was happening right around here? Tech bubble. Tech bubble and. And happens in September. We celebrate it. Election. Nine eleven. Is November. Nine eleven. That's correct. All right. Duh. Anybody have a guess what happened here? Oh wait. Oh wait. That's right. And uh, you see a little bit of a blip here. That's tw twenty eighteen small. So at three out of every four years, the market's up, but they're uh, uh, it's up. But you know, one out of four, the market's down, right? Um, but if you take a look, what's your time horizon? Is your time horizon one year? Well. 87% of the time, if you look at just five-year periods, the market's up. And 100% of the periods of 15-year, the market's up. What does that tell you? It's sometimes when we look at what is our time horizon for money, we confuse that to what's going on in the present. And we have this bias that we project what's happening now is going to happen forever, right? Like what's happening right now? Interest rates are high. So what are you hearing from your clients? Oh, interest rates are going to be high forever. Home prices are high. They're going to be high forever, right? Is that true? Maybe. So what we, uh, we got to look at more macro picture. If you're in your 30s and you're trying to buy financial freedom by uh, your 60s, your time horizon is more than a year. So you need to look at the grander scale. Um, so you need to avoid making emotional decisions that are just based on what's happening presently. But let's talk about goal setting. Um, I put this here because hey, you guys over here, I want to, uh, from clients, I want to buy a vacation house. Yeah, but th is that a goal? Yeah. It's kind of, but it's like, okay, well, you need more information if you're going to find them one, right? So same with investments. We want to have very, very specific goals. So this is, I would say, a goal that would represent how I can actually get a client what they want. I want to know what about that vacation house. Does it have beach access? How many bedrooms? What does a porch look like? How much do you need for a down payment for a property like that? What's the time horizon of when you need it? So when you think of what, what are investment goals, we need to have really, really well-defined goals rather than very abstract because it's hard with, with abstract goals to know exactly what you're trying to achieve and how to build a strategy to get it. Um, 
same thing. So they, they talk about like smart goals. Um, I, I think also what's important with investments is uh, what resources are subject to that goal. So um, people said you had kids. Who, who has kids uh, younger than 10? You, got, you have kids younger than 10? Okay. Do you want them to be able to go to, to college or is that not important to you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Right. I don't know. Want the option? Yeah, the option. It, it's hard to say when they're younger than 10, though, right? Mm -hmm. Are they going to UCF or Harvard? Who the fuck knows? It's hard <laughs> to say at that point, right? Like, well, Johnny can do some math on his you know, third grade worksheet, maybe, <laughs> but it's hard to say. Um, but we need to define what resources are going to be there. A 401k that has penalties of accessing it before you're 59 and a half, is that a resource to save for their college? Probably a lot of cost to do that, so maybe not. Um, so we need to define what are the right steps, and also just like what are the action steps that are needed. Like in real estate, you want to buy a house. Th there's a couple steps that you have to make before like this actually happens, and you have to do them in the right sequence. So I think it's really important, like when you're goal setting. Okay, what are the specific nature of your goals, and like what. What steps and what resources can we put together to build it? Um, second is risk and reward. Um, so I, I, of course, as someone who does holistic planning, I'm going to tell you, this is, you know, bright, shiny thing. This is fucking awesome. This is what we're going for, like buying financial freedom or buying a vacation house. But in the real world, shit happens, right? So how do we mitigate the risk? to make sure if something does happen, I still have a high likelihood of success towards my goals. So um, do you guys remember last year, the hurricanes that happened? Uh, any, any of your clients have to do a claim on their home because of damage? Or you personally, you had to? What, what happened to your house? Uh, there's really the fence. The yeah. fence got blown down. Yeah. And it's, so it's just like, it, and, and was that, what was your name again? Adam. Adam. Was that Adam's fault that the fence came down? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's, it's just, it's stuff happens. So just protect yourself from the things that could go wrong of that are things that you can control or if you can't control it by insurance, where insurance is necessary. Things like if you die, become disabled, those are pretty big risks that are easy to insure. Make sure you do that because especially if you're in your 30s, your earning power is fairly significant. Um, that means if you're gone, probably it probably shouldn't need that. Um, but as it relates to investments, people talk about risk tolerance. So these are really the components that I think make up uh, how you look at investments from a risk perspective. One would be your time frame for what the investment is. So like this year, my plan is I'm saving up enough extra money for another quantum leap in our business to move my in-laws to Orlando. They currently live in Clearwater, but I have 11 summers left before I send my wonderful firstborn son to college. I don't want to waste those without family close by. I'm envious of this guy. He's got his family close by. I want to build that for my family. My time horizon for that is like eight to 12 months of when I'm going to buy. The money I put away for that goal, I look at that in a different lens than when, I'm, when I plan to be financially independent and retire you know, 20, 30 years from now, right? Can I take more or less risk with my money for my house for my in-laws? What would you say? More risk or less risk? Right now, probably more. Less risk. Time rising shorter. Less risk, right? If the market goes down, I'm fucked if I put it in there and I need it in eight to 12 months, right? So I got to be more careful with that, but I can take more risk with something that's 20, 30 years out, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Withdrawal time frame. So do I need the money all at once or do I need it over time? So a large part of the money that we manage is more for clients that are retired and taking money for a long period of time. And then there are other people where they need it all in one shot, right? We would have different risk profiles for that, 
right? Because if you need it all in one shot, we got to really be careful as we approach that deadline and mitigate the risk. If we're taking it out piece by piece over time, well, we can afford to take more risk over time, right? Stable assets. Do you have assets that vary wildly or do you have assets that are pretty darn rock solid? So what would be an example of a stable asset? Real estate. Real estate? What else? Crypto. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stable asset, maybe a savings account, right? Do you have them? Do you not? Um, personal liquidity, kind of same thing. If something goes wrong, do you have the ability to access money? If you have seven rental properties, but $70 in the bank, low liquidity, that means we're taking way too much risk right now. It, adding additional risk may be not doable if we don't have liquidity. And income stability. Everybody in this room, including me, we make variable income, right? Now, I have some stable income from renewals and from managing money, but my income changes, so that affects my profile, right? And how I look at risk. I may make $70,000 next month or $700 next month. I don't know. Got to go grind, and that affects how do we take risks. So understanding all these components of what makes up your profile may make it so that your neighbor is doing one thing, but you're doing another, and both are totally fine. It's just whatever works for your situation. And then I like looking at this. This is, this is by decade, what's going on. So since 1950, the S&P 500 has uh, grossed 11.5%. Okay? We've had five big down markets during that period of time, but 11.5%. So if you put $1,000 in January 1st, 1950, and you put it in an investment account that was just one-to-one -one correlated to the S&P 500, you would have made a rate of return of 19.4%. Anybody mad about that? That's fucking good, right? Yeah. Down with that. 1960, civil rights movement, 7.8, 70s, 5.9, 80s. You get the whole picture. 2000s is the decade. People say that's the lost decade because... You had tech bubble, 9-11, and the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression. So if you put $1,000 in, basically you got $1,000 out at the end of the decade. Mm -hmm. Imagine being retired during that period. It's you you got to make sure that you're taking money out. You don't have an income anymore, and the money's got to keep growing to beat inflation, right? So we look at this, and we say, okay, the long view is... Over the long haul, stocks perform well, but they don't perform the same, right? So you've got to have a mix, and you uh, you want to make sure that you have, you have stocks in your portfolio because they provide you liquidity, but they also have variability in their growth. Uh, so when we look at that, it's like, well, we can't put it all in one basket. Where do we put it? Um, this is, someone said, where was it? Um, passive income. Uh, that was, I think, Adams. You wanted to cover that, right? Yeah. So my, I have a designation called the RICP, the Retirement Income Certified Professional. Uh, so my job for retirees is how do we take all your life savings of assets that you build up, turn them into an income stream that you can't outlive. When I don't know what Congress is going to do, what inflation is going to do, what the market's going to do, or when you're going to die. If I knew all those things, it'd be so much fucking easier to do it. But we can't, right? So we put it in places that mitigate the risk so that we know statistically whether we get lucky or unlucky with any of those variables, we're still going to make it out on top. So where do I see passive income? Is I want to make sure that for clients that their base income their, uh, for their fixed expenses is being met by their secure sources of income. Okay, follow me so far? So that's things like social security, their variable income from real estate, any pensions that they're eligible for. We wanna make sure fixed costs are take it, taken care of by those sources. So what's an example of a fixed expense? Mortgage, mortgage, rent, mortgage, rent. What else? 
taxes, insurance, insurance, utilities, food. food. Yeah, exactly, right? Wouldn't it be nice to know in mailbox money all that shit's just taken care of by sources we can count on? Right? Yeah. We know we got a floor of income that, that can be taken care of. And then our discretionary, we that can be met by our investments, money that's put away somewhere, that our pile of money can pay for that. So what are discretionary expenses? Vacations. Vacations. Yeah. Eating out. What else? Yes. Gifts. General shopping. Taking on my ancestry. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to say exactly what those are going to be when you're in your 30s, when you're in your 60s, but we can have some idea to be able to shoot for it. But the idea is we have a pile of money that can spit out those things. Um, our home run dollars have the most rate of return opportunity, but they also have the most volatility and the least liquidity, right? So inside of closely held businesses, so I run a closely held business with my financial planning practice. I plan to sell it for NFL money one day, but um, it ain't liquid. It's not like I could sell it in two days because I, I mean, I could, but I might get nickels on the dollar for it, right? If I needed liquidity right away. Um, in real estate, it's not as liquid, right? But it's probably got more home run potential than money in a savings account. And we never want to have to be forced into a position to have to sell when it's an inopportune time to an inopportune buyer, right? So to protect our home run assets, we have diversified liquid positions. So these are your retirement accounts, your non qual accounts, your trust accounts, your deferred annuities. The idea there is how they're invested is not all in one thing, but it's uh, diversified among many things. So that per unit of risk, we're getting the most amount of rate of return opportunity. So we call that efficient relationship with investments, okay? Because can we predict exactly what, what the market's gonna do each and every year, yes or no? No. No. So by owning all the market in the right proportions, we hit it. And by having multiple account types and titling, that provides us more liquidity in doing so, more tax diversification in doing so. Okay. And then what happens if the home run money is not a good time to sell? And then what happens if the diversified money, the stock market's also down? We want to make sure that we have safe sources of money so that in inopportune times, we could produce income, distribute from our assets, and not have to sell at an inopportune time from our other two that have high rate return opportunities. The downside to save money is how much How much has your savings account given you over the last 10 years? Dude, we spike costing money due to inflation. Yeah, right, that, that's a big concern, right? Sure. Maybe this year is one of the first in like a decade, where you're seeing savings accounts get us two, three, four percent again. And maybe we're keeping pace with inflation, but it it's good for short-term savings. But if I told you I had a client that they had a net worth of four million and three million was in cash, do you think I'm doing my job? Yes or no? No, right? Because it's could they have more upside in home run tools like real estate closely held businesses? Do they have more upside in diversifying in investment accounts? Yeah. So there's a limit with how much safe we have. So the way I look at uh, safe is short-term safe, we put in savings, money markets, and CDs because they can yield liquid returns, and those returns could about match inflation or maybe a little bit above. And then for long-term, if the clients are healthy enough, we look at accumulated value in life insurance contracts because those are tax advantage and they can beat inflation by a higher margin. But the idea is by the time they get to retirement, I want to have four parts here. If they don't have any home run assets, four parts here, one part here. Anybody guess why? Five years. Every five years, the market goes down, right? So I want to make sure we're ready. If you want to take your 
is Chris and Yim are going to take their 50 year wedding anniversary trip and it falls in a down uh, stock market. It's not like you can reschedule that, right? So you want to make sure that you have a, a source to be able to do that. I have a question. What's up? The, the life insurance, what is that? Uh, the accumulated value of life insurance. You can use life insurance contracts, kind of the opposite of the way most people think of where a lot of death benefit pays out if you die to uh, you know, survivors like your spouse, uh, your children. It would be the opposite. It's more designed as a savings tool and we reduce the amount of death benefit. And so if you look at big corporations, like what's a big corporation that you know of? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, okay. What do you think the CEO of Coca-Cola makes? 25 mil. Somewhere in that ballpark. I don't know exactly, but somewhere in that ballpark. Do you know what the limit is on a 401k? I don't. It's $20,500 plus a catch-up provision on top of that. So maybe like another three or 4,000. Do you think the head of Coca-Cola, the CEO, is just maxing out his 401k? or she's maxing out her 401k and that's going to get her to retirement. Nope. No, it's fucking crazy, right? How, how are you going to do that? So life insurance allows you to put money in safe vehicles with unlimited limits in, in there and the money grows without tax and you can take it out tax-free. The downside with it is it's not a great pay, place to put liquid money and the rate of return usually is not going to match what we do in diversified accounts and in our home runs. So the, its sweet spot of where it fits is it's a really good place for mid and long term safe money so that when you get down the road, you have tax advantage safe money. Is that like the, the whole life policy that you put money in and you could borrow from it and that kind of thing? Too? Yeah, so if it's designed right. Yeah. So there's a lot of the whole life, like I work with a, a couple of orange grove farmers and their concern is not about accumulating cash and life insurance policies. It's about permanent death benefit. And that those are whole life products. But the reason they need permanent death benefit is estate taxes. Do you guys know what estate taxes are? No. If you die with X amount of net worth, you, you know, your estate gets taxed. Okay, so the limit is 11 million, uh, or no, it might be over 12 million for a couple, okay? So if I told you an orange grove farmer, how much do you how much of that net worth do you think is in the in the farm? A lot or a little? A lot. So okay, let's say they die 50 million net worth. They die, 45 million is in the farm. They, they have up to the limit of 12 is exempt. After that, the tax is 45%. Wow. Yeah. How are you going to pay the tax? How do you, sell the you sell the farm or you buy life insurance, put it in an irrevocable life insurance tr uh, trust outside of the estate. Once they die, both spouses die, the life insurance pays out, but no one gives a fuck about the cash that it built over time. They care about the death benefits so they can pay the government. Then the farm passes to the next generation tax free. So that would be an example of whole life design for death benefit. You've got to design whole life right to build up cash value as a savings tool. It's not always designed for savings. Yeah. And you got to medically qualify for it to be the rate of return really to work out. Do you deal with all that too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anything on here I deal with, I usually, these I coordinate. So we have wealthy people, they have closely held businesses, or they have real estate, or they're in private equity. Um, those are things I coordinate in the plan. Everything else we, we go ahead and take care of. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then this is the efficiency frontier. I'm just checking time to make sure. I'm, uh, this is, remember how we talked about per unit of risk, we want the most amount of return? So this is uh, what modern portfolio theory is all about. People always thought that it was a one-to-one -one relationship. You've heard like, no risk it, no biscuit, right? Yeah, uh, no risk, no return. Well, people thought it was a linear model. For every unit of risk, you have a unit of return. And that goes on in infinity, right? 
but you know from real estate that you've represented or seen out there where it's like, you know, this property is fucking crazy. Like anyone who wants to deal with this, sure, but it's got limited upside, but massive amounts of risk, right? Mm -hmm. So modern portfolio theory talked about an efficiency frontier that it's not infinite and linear, that it's parabolic. So we talk about when we design portfolios, what we do is we design them to own specific amounts of equity and fixed income. So in combination of owning all the asset classes, we get the most amount of rate of return possible for the least amount of risk. And that is different based on your risk tolerance. So if you're an aggressive investor, you have more equities and fixed income, but you have more upside. That's someone who has a longer time horizon, right? That's for Chris and his family. who They're not planning to retire for maybe two, three decades from now. Their, their risk tolerance would be greater. If I looked at my client, Ethel Benstead, who's 73 years old, her risk tolerance is more over here, where she wants more fixed income than equities, but she doesn't want an inefficient mix. So if I said Ethel, she has a portfolio here where her risk is the same, but her upside is lower than what's sufficient, we would say that's not a really great portfolio. That's not a great way to invest. And we'd also say if she was over here with similar upside, but significantly more risk, we would say that's not really a great portfolio. We should probably have a better design, right? Mm -hmm. So when we design portfolios, the focus is, and that's not sexy, right? Like if I show you, if you go to a cocktail party, and this is definitely up Chris's alley, where you go, yeah, I'm looking at my portfolio and I beat everybody in this fucking place with, with my quarterly returns. Does that matter? Uh, by the way, I was joking. He doesn't care about stuff like that. Um, it doesn't matter. All that matters is, do you have a statistical likelihood of hitting your goal, right? Why would you take more risk with similar upside? Maybe, maybe you have good returns beating someone for a quarter because you're overly concentrated, but why take more risk than is needed than to just uh, an efficient relationship, right? So diversification, not sexy, but it is the thing that pays because you can smooth out variable returns. You can have more predictable returns. And then if you love the periodic table, you would love this. Um, anybody colorblind in here? No? I wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this shows to color coordinate it. So you can see like there's no real pattern of each year because this shows each year from 2007 all the way to 2021, what are the real returns of indexes in different asset classes? So in 2021, real estate was up 45.9% across the country right? It was the highest performing asset class. So if you had nothing but real estate and you had a friend who diversified, their, your rate of return would be significantly higher, right? But is it always true that real estate is the top performer every year? Yes or no? No. no. But does that mean you shouldn't have it in your portfolio? No, you have to have real estate. You have to have each of these things because you don't know what's going to be the top performer, right? Mm -hmm. Like if if I had a portfolio that didn't have clients in real estate uh, in 2021, I'm an idiot, right? Because this is not, uh, they would look at that and say, the, the top asset class you didn't have me in, that seems crazy, right? But we want to make sure that we own all of the asset classes in the right proportion to reduce risk. So you'll see the white area in here. See how it smooths out returns? By owning everything, that means you're never the top performing asset class, right? Because by definition, you're gonna have some losers in there. But also that means you're never at the bottom. So you're always smoothing out returns. So as an example, the hardest part about my job in 2021, when the market was going crazy, the S&P 500 did 28.7% in a balanced portfolio, 
did 12. So client is telling me, whoa, if I just invested all in the S&P 500, I would have done 28, but I did 12. Why would I do that? Well, is that how it always works? Is the S&P 500 always going to be that high? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't work that way. 2008, minus 30%, 37%. We like that? No, that sucks, right? We like the idea that did we prevent 14% of loss by just being diversified. So what does diversification do? Smooth out returns, reduces risk. Step four, discipline. This is one of those things where this is why when they publish it every year, the difference between institutional investors and uh, individual investors, why there's a difference. Because so many individual investors propelled by the media say that the best way to go ahead and get investment returns is time the market and security select your way there. Anybody know who Jim Cramer is? He's the bad money guy. Mad money guy, right? Presses all the buttons, buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. Do you think he manages his own money that way? Yes or no? No. No. That's just for just, entertainment. It, if he was so good at that, he would be a hedge fund manager, right? But he's paid a salary to be an entertainer on television to promote you, the individual, to be the sucker. Wrong? No, just look at the map. If you miss the top 10 days, just the top 10 in a decade, your rate of return in the index goes from 9.49 all the way to 5.3. And sorry, this is two decades, 2002 to 2021. Just 10 days you miss, you miss out on 4% rate of return. What does that tell you? Discipline pays. It's the person who shows up at the gym every day. Is the person that typically is really happy with what they look at in the mirror. It's the person who watches their diet every day. Typically the person who's the most healthy. So discipline is what's sexy. If you miss the 50 best days, you lose money over 20 years. So if you want to try to time the market, that's fine. I just don't know that you're going to be able to time the bottom and the top efficiently. But I know if you stay in, it pays. Discipline ain't sexy, but it sure does pay. And that's just in life. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is my favorite. I love showing this to people. You want to be a millionaire by age 65. What does it cost uh, you and how much you have to save versus how much does compound interest help you? If you're uh, at 25 years old and you just save the same amount every month, you need to save $381 if we assume that you can get 7% return on your money. Net of fees, expenses, market return, all that. That means from 25 to 65, you put in 182 and compound interest pays you 817,000. If you start at 45, that means you have to, to get to the same destination, you have to put 1,900 a month away. Same amount every month. That means you have to put 460 away and compound interest pays you 539,000. If you wait a little bit longer and I catch you at 55, we can get to a million, but you gotta put 5,700 away per month. You put away 693,000, compound interest will pay you 306. What's the moral of the story? Start early. Just start early. <laughs> Compound interest isn't sexy in the beginning, right? What's 10% of uh, $100? 10 bucks, right? So it's totally understandable. When you start, it's not sexy to keep going or to do that. The first day you go to the gym and you step on the scale the next day, how much weight have you lost? Maybe nothing, right? But Compounded over time, a habit like that, you can see it pays you really well. And I'm assuming 7%. I'm not assuming what the market has been 11.5% over the last 50 years. I'm assuming underperformance. And then momentum. So this is just going over what does compound interest give you? Well, it, it makes sure that these things happen over time. So 
Um, anybody read the book by James Clear, um, uh, Atomic Habits? Yeah. yeah, so this is just like, if you start, this is why I said, if you're in your 20s and 30s, this is why habit formation with uh, investments are more important than where you invest the money. Because if you're in the habit of saving and you underperform the market, you're much more likely to hit your goal than the someone, the person who is average or better than average, but an inconsistent saver, right? Because compound interest will pay you over and over and over. Reinvesting those dividends will pay you over and over and over. So this chart just shows if you go ahead and you put in a thousand dollars, but instead of reinvesting the dividends or um, instead of reinvesting the gains, where does the money get you? So this is just a great example of, hey, let compound interest be your best friend. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing this now. Uh, become uh, billionaires. Uh, so um, let me get back in here. So this is just like the step-by-steps that I, uh, I would say when you're investing, when you're looking to invest either for yourself or with your client, just letting them know what's the, what's the goals and how specific are you to make those goals? What is the risk reward relationship and how are you maximizing on the reward, minimizing the risk? Um, how do you diversify to spread out that risk? Um, how do you make sure that you maintain discipline? One of the best ways you maintain discipline, have someone who's uh, accountable to you or accountable to your goals that's unbiased to make sure when you have your emotional moments, which are human, doesn't make you a bad person, right? Like 2020, anybody know what happened in the stock market between February and March? Go up or down? Yeah. Why? COVID. COVID, how much? 60%. 60% would be more like you're talking about crypto markets, but you're talking 34% in a month and a half. 34% in a month and a half. That's a lot, right? So you need discipline in those moments because the average individual investor, what did they do? So, And what happened by the end of the year? Was the market up or down? Uh, how much? 23%. 18.4%. They lost that. They lost in the run up. Yeah. So discipline pays. And then momentum. Let your progress build and celebrate little wins, right? If you save $1,000 and you've never saved a dime before, you need to go and celebrate selling, uh, saving $1,000. Go out to dinner. Find a way to celebrate so that you get positive reinforcement for doing the hard stuff. Um, so, uh, that is, um, a little bit about us. I, uh, the reason we partner with Northwestern Mutual, uh, in our planning practice, because we, you know, I, I get calls to move all the time. Like I'm sure you guys do it, Why do you, why do you partner with Keller Williams? I'm sure there are reasons for me. Northwestern Mutual is a triple A by all four major independent rating agencies with a positive outlook for the future. And they're not publicly traded uh, financial services company. That allows them a more longer term view. They are my research arm for our investments. They have 36 CFAs up at the home office. Do you guys know what a CFA is? Certified financial analyst. 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 It, it takes three years to pass that test minimum. And the average salary for a CFA is 400, or sorry, the average starting salary for a CFA is $450,000. Those are typically the people who run hedge funds or mutual funds. Okay. Northwestern employs 36 of them to go ahead and do all the research. So I manage a little bit of mine. But they, as a company, we manage a lot of money. We're the fourth biggest broker dealer in the country. So they interview all the mutual fund managers. And we get to you know, get the benefit of all their research. Because if I call the head of the Fidelity VIP Contra Fund and say, what's your strategy for battling Q2 with uh, what the, the Fed's no longer doing rate increases? So what, what are you guys doing right now? You think that guy's calling me back? 
No, no, I'm too small. You think they're calling Northwestern back if one of our CFAs call? Oh, you better believe it. Yeah. Um, and then we're, we were founded as an insurance company 160 or 165 uh, years ago. We have always been a very strong insurance company and proud that we partner with an insurance company because they have an insurance arm that allows us to have a general account portfolio with exclusive access to that general account portfolio. That's the secret sauce because we can bring safe money solutions to our clients alongside an open architecture on the investment side that no one else can. And because people are happy, 97% of policy owners keep their policies. Um, so um, this is a QR code. I put it on uh, all the note uh, pages. It links right to my calendar. So if you're like, yo, this guy is actually um, not horrible um, and you'd want to meet with me either to talk more or to um, talk how I can help you, um, Put a spot on your calendar, super easy, but love to talk to you. And we could do it over Zoom uh, if you want, just so that I'm logistically excellent for you, because I know your time is money, um, or you're welcome to come into the office, whatever is easier for you. Um, but I know we got about like four minutes, so I want to be respectful of your time. What questions are kind of running through your head? What's up? I apologize. I got to meet with Mike. You're going to uh, finish the long morning stuff with me. So okay. It might be 10 minutes late. Okay. See ya. I think okay. I think you or someone. I don't know what to okay. not for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was confused. Uh huh? uh C D course. What questions may be running through your mind? What what questions do y'all have that I can help with? Uh, I think I mean I'm, I am interested in meeting with you. Okay. Um and um, for personal, and then also, I'm I'm running into a lot more because what what I've been doing is meeting with a lot of uh, like baby boomers and like kind of the older generation, and making sure that they're equipped in order to get to the next stage of life. Yeah, you know. So um, I'd like to kind of pick your brain about that too. Yeah. Um, making sure that absolutely everything. And that they're able to afford what's next. And that's the thing. It's like you want buyers that are going to buy more than one time. I mean, you certainly want them to buy one time, but you want them to buy more than one time for you. So you got to like find ways. How do you be value add so they remember you next time? Um, I would love to meet with you. Click yeah. the link. Super easy. I'll set it up for sure. Um, do a copy or something. Love that. Um, oh, I said I would do the phone thing. Shortcuts. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, who has an iPhone? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry if you're on Zoom. I'll show you guys real quick. This is something that I do. Um, probably everybody's up there, actually. Could I? 